Metro 2033 is an atmospheric first person shooter, or FPS if you're trying to keep up with the lingo of kids these days, set in present day Russia, and is based off the real life account of one Dmitry G... Getru... Dmitry last name, and oh boy let me tell you, you thought commuting in the London underground was bad? <laughs> You ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, these bastards are so poor that they're making vodka out of mushrooms for fuck's sake. I guess that's what happens when the president reallocates government funds for the new budgeting plan. Take it from me, karate lessons ain't cheap. Back to the metro. Sorry in advance if you notice the footage shifting from pleasant to what the fuck why are you using a console footage right now, because trust me, I had every intention of playing this game through on my PC, but then I got to a part in the game where it just kept crashing like a hijacked airliner. I tried, trust me, I fucking tried to make the damn game work and boy, it didn't want to play. But after much wrangling of my system and downloading a few ancient drivers, rebooting my system and launching the game in safe mode, I finally got it to work stress free. Mostly. I don't have an easy segue from that sentence, so let's talk about how the game looks for a moment. The game looks very nice, even if the game is almost a decade old. The textures aren't anything too fancy or great, it won't win any gaming awards anytime soon. But on max settings, the game looks semi up to par with modern day titles, although I definitely get the uncanny valley effect when I look at some of the characters, like this guy. I see this man's face when I go to sleep, and I don't mean that in a nice way. I mean that in a better keep the 12 gauge close just in case way, that I think this bastard is going to watch me sleep and cut my neck open. Look at him! Them's psycho eyes. Even if the characters do look a bit off sometimes, the design for the world and your weapons looks much better. I truly get the feeling that I'm walking around the streets of Moscow, complete with the famous mail order brides and crackheads roaming the streets. If there's one part of the game I think deserves special mention, it'd be the lighting. It kind of puts the whole atmosphere into atmospheric. Whether you're in the city of Moscow itself or in the underground hellhole, all of the lighting is really top notch in creating such a great environment. Couple that lighting with some tessellation and the smoke and mist effects they've put into this documentary, and there's plenty of background resources to tank your graphics card. I've got a 1080 and I'm like 90% sure it isn't overclocked. Combined with a 6600K to run the game and all the settings maxed out, I can stick around 80 to 70 frames a second without V-Sync. Although when I did run the benchmark without V-Syncs, the results were interesting. Then I flicked on V-Sync and everything was all good. My favourite thing to look at in the game though is that one hooker from the bar. Real talk though, it's the guns. Ain't no woman getting between me and my guns. Not only do the guns have that practicality of a style sense that normally comes with making guns in an apocalypse, the bastard, for example, is some weird crossover between a Sten gun and Fallout. The basic design is the same, but the internals have been fucked with a bit. My pick for best gun in the game would definitely be the Shambler, because it's basically a revolver shotgun, and just in case you missed that, it's a revolver that fires shotgun shells. This is a weapon literally made by Jesus. No, I don't care that the buy gun is a thing, but every weapon needs an application, and as much as these guns would give Americans a nice second amendment hard on, the main things you'll be using these guns against aren't humans. You know, the usual stuff. Bitches, Nostralis, Nazis, Communists. So let's talk about the combat. Let's be real, there's only one way to play through the combat, when you're fighting humans anyway, and that's by pretending you're Sam Fisher, and knifing your way through the enemy like a scalpel through an abortion. For the non-human enemies, however, any of the shotguns are the best and only solution. Don't let the game tell you that an assault rifle might be better because it gives one to all of your AI partners. Shotguns, 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 and nothing but SHOTGUNS. There's four difficulties to the game. Two of them being what you'd expect, with the first one being normal and the second one being HARDCORE. Then there's two immersion difficulties. Both completely remove the HUD and crosshair, 
as well as upping the damage output of both the enemies and your character, naturally making the game a bit harder. Ranger is the equivalent of normal with the other modifiers I mentioned earlier, and then Ranger Hardcore is the sort of game mode that'll give you a challenge for most of the game up until you get to the library. Then you might as well format your hard drive to save yourself the pain of that level. Playing through the game on the scrub normal, the game isn't head bashingly hard, but if you fuck up good enough you'll be put in the ground. The AI definitely isn't winning any awards, but then again, the game helps it out as much as it can by forgetting that walls and physics are a thing for a moment. Human enemies will do the classic sit behind cover with just enough of their head exposed that you can land a headshot, and the creatures will just rush you with overwhelming numbers. There's no tactical depth to the combat apart from plinking helmets and unloading Soviet buckshot at close range, and that plinking I'm talking about is very satisfying, but that's down to the sound design itself. The sound for the game, along with the environmental design, is its strongest asset by far. If you remove the sound design and score from the game, it wouldn't have the same post-apocalyptic feeling that defines it. From the haunting echoes of dead ghosts as you walk through the tunnel with Khan, to the subtle sounds of monsters, especially the lurkers. Oh, they sound lovely. And if you didn't catch it, yes, I did shit myself. The soundtrack for the game without a doubt fits the setting as well as being very pleasant to listen to on its own. It ranges from the nice solo acoustic guitar tracks, which are my pick from the composer's work, to the battle themes that involve more electrical guitar and bass drum elements. There's definitely also a few tracks that feel like they're from a different game entirely. One problem that I have with the soundtrack, however, is that it overuses droning trumpets and other brass instruments in the background for the more ambient tracks. That's my only problem with it, the rest is great. Arguably, the most important part of the sound, however, is the dialogue, because, you know, that's an important part of the story. In basic form, the narrative of the game is just about the protagonist, Artyom, who doesn't speak much outside of loading screens. He's basically trying to be a goody two-shoes and save everyone in his home station, which apparently is out on the edges of the civilized metro, if the name Exhibition didn't tip you off enough already. Then the rest of the game is Artyom slaughtering everything in his path up until the conclusion of the game where you wipe out the big bad with nuclear fire. If you're a fucking boring human, that is. You could also read into the game a bit more and not be the blind murdering asshole that every other game encourages you to be. If you heed the words that Khan gives you near the midpoint of the game, then you'll have an entirely different ending to the one other people would have gotten for just playing the game. You can accidentally get this ending, but there's a fair bit of work that needs to be done to be sure that's the ending you receive. As to the structure of the game's narrative, it's fairly simple. In the first mission, you're given a job by Hunter to travel to a different station and deliver a message. After leaving home with a merchant rail car, you're ambushed by monsters and anomalies. But you've got a shotgun at this point in the game and the monsters are reduced to charred embers once you reach a safe haven. Then the game introduces Bourbon, the shittiest Soviet Union cousin of any Han Solo clone who thinks he's all that. This brings up another thing I have to criticise the game for. Almost every time it gives you a companion character, they're separated from you in some way to make you fight your own battles and enforce that dread that would come with being alone in such a hostile environment. Anyway, once you meet Bourbon, he agrees to take you part way to your destination off Polis. After being led through some spooky as fuck tunnels, you kill some bandits and monsters before being saved slash let into Hansa, where Bourbon does what any sane person would do and double cross the guys with the bigger daka dakas before you run up into the present day city of Moscow. This is where you meet the crackheads and bitches I was talking about before, and after rummaging through a few apartment buildings where the tenants are oddly absent, I don't know, maybe they're running the late shift at the factory or something. You can even stick grenade a bitch and stuff. You eventually meet back up with Bourbon and run into a whole mob of crackheads before you pull Bourbon into relative safety of the underground. Safe for you, not safe for Bourbon. As he's captured by some bandits and taken away while you keep his end of the bargain for him and snatch his glorious and beautiful Kleshnikov assault rifle. You then sweep through the camp and purge the scum from the underground 
with a little bit of outsider help at some points. You eventually find Bourbon deeper in the complex just to see him get shot and killed. But it's alright because this is where you meet Khan, the best character and main messenger to the main theme of the game. He guides you through some more spooky tunnels until you reached the Cursed Station, and with a name like that you know some shit is about to go down. At Cursed, you need to pick up the slack of some dead men and plant a bomb on one of the tunnels to collapse it. Then you need to do the same to an airlock before Khan abandons you like his father did to him and sends you straight into the armory, where communists are rounding up the non-believers for whatever it is communists do with their party guests. After you've been saved by the blacksmith, he then sends you straight into a literal war zone between the Reds and the Nazis. Once you murder your way through most of the war zone, you're helped out by the Spetsnaz, or Spartans as they're called in this universe, because we wouldn't want to rile up any real world comparisons in this video, would we? They give you a cart ride and a half, first in a mounted machine gun, then in a simpler rail car, where you suddenly make the world have a few more widows. Once your cart crashes because Artyom can't handle the fucking brakes properly, you run through some more spooky tunnels until you reach another station and help them hold out against the horrors of the subway. But because this is a game and progress needs to happen, your brain is attacked by the paranormal and the monsters break through into the settlement. This is where I ran into my problem I mentioned at the start of the video. I could play a whole minute of gameplay before it randomly froze and kept playing for a bit and then crashed back to the desktop. If you're thinking about getting this game at this stage, Please be aware that the crashing is a thing and don't let it get in the way of your experience. There's a few methods for fixing the game floating around online, but the way that did it for me was installing an old DirectX file and enabling my .NET framework through the command line. I've left a link in the description for the stream thread that tipped me off to the fix. Anyway. Once you power through that station and the horrors that lurk within, you find a young lad mourning over his uncle, and the kid breaks rule 1 of life by listening to the strange man with the candy, and he climbs on your back. As a side note, I hate what this kid does to your movement, the swaying is stupid and I don't like it, but I understand why it's done that way. Once you return the unharmed but traumatized child back to his mother, you travel back to the surface and walk right into a Nazi patrol, and these boys are kitted out for a fight. If there was ever a point in the game that I'd say use stealth and try not to make the heavily armored man angry, it'd be this point. Once you've skirted around the patrol and make a death run between some Nazis and some bitches, you meet back up with Olman, one of those Spartan folks you met so long ago. You run through another Nazi station and hop onto another rail car, and finally make it to Polis and Miller, just to get shot down by the Council of Polis and forced to take matters into your own hands, or rather, Miller's hands. He promptly comes up with the plan to find D6 and activate it, so it's back up to the surface for you to find the military archives in the National Library that should lead you to D6. And I'll say this right now, this library level, it can get fucked. Format your hard drive once you make it to this point, it'll be a much more pleasant experience than anything this level has to offer you. But once you power through the library, you make it to Sparta, the only outdoor base of the entire metro. Which is stupid to have a base outdoors when the surface is a radiation blasted hellscape with more monsters than patches of grass. You then take your crew of boys into D6 to reactivate it and hopefully fire off the nukes. Spoilers, it doesn't quite work out that way. On the way into the heart of the facility, you and your boys run into a few mobs of enemies for the fuck of it. This is where you become aware of how much the revolving shotgun is a genius of design and should be made a real world thing as soon as possible. Please don't do that. We're good enough at killing each other already. Once you run through the monsters and meet the big goop monster that can fire toxic acid pockets of shit at you, you finally head to the tower to set up the homing laser for the nukes. The game then brings you back to the prologue, which I completely forgot to mention because I'm an idiot, or because I'm already a six pack deep and I'm not stopping now. After you get through the initial combat spike that started the game, you run through a herd of monsters to get to the tower to fire the D6. At this point, even on the Spartan game mode, you'll probably start running out of ammo. You run up to the tower in a basic platforming segment and even kill a bitch. And once you finally make it to the top of the tower, the Dark Ones invade your mind and make you kill yourself. The Dark Ones, by the way, are the reason you left your home station in the first place, as the hospital was littered with the broken men who encountered such monsters. Once you shoot the Dark One in your mind, which somehow also kills the one in the real world, you let the homing beacon tap into the missiles and let them fly free. Or, you are a good boy through the game and get the option to shoot the homing laser instead, because you actually thought for a second instead of just playing the game like a blind animal. You paid attention to the words of Khan and gave your entire approach to the game a second thought, because maybe 
The Dark Ones aren't here to kill you, they're just reacting to some extremely hostile actions. If you play the game and notice the edges of the screen flash white for a moment, that means you've gained a morale point, which is a hidden track stat that is essential for deciding which ending you get. And if you don't get the option at the end of the game, then you weren't a good boy and have to live with yourself committing the genocide of a psychic paranormal race who didn't really mean to harm you at all. That's the main theme of the game as well. Think before you act, gain a bit more information on a situation before you go headlong into hell with an ill-informed standpoint. If only a few more people today followed that thinking. All in all, Metro 2033 is a very atmospheric FPS that absolutely nails the immersion of being in modern day Russia. The combat leaves a little bit to be desired but the stealth aspect more than makes up for its shortcomings. The soundtrack is a nice mix across the board, but the acoustic guitar tracks are the pick of the bunch. And the story has a good message behind it that'll probably not be noticed for most of the people who play it without the knowledge beforehand. I give it a yes out of 10. You can find the link for the game in the description, and I do recommend buying and playing it. I've been Infamous Sir Hellfire. You have been my lovely brethren. Keep an ear to the ground for the next two videos in this series hidden amongst the other uploads. I'll see you all in the next one. Shit. Shit. Sick of Billy.